And uh, I'd like for us to begin with a word of prayer. First of all, I want to see, is there anybody here who is here with the conference, the hospitality conference that's going on? Hey, welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming today. Really glad you came. So, and good to see you all over here as well. So, uh, for those of you who are resurrection folks, today we have, today and tomorrow, we have a conference on the art of hospitality. And I think we've got about 200 folks from across the U.S. who are here for that. Uh, Pastors, staff members, lay people who are uh, involved in hospitality in their local churches. How's the conference been going so far? Awesome. That's really great. Well, we're so glad you are here and a part of this. I'm glad you came tonight, too, after a whole day being in a conference, and here you are this evening. But uh, what we did is a a few weeks ago, I I had this thought, it would be great to get people together from Resurrection who have questions and be able to try to answer as many of those questions as possible. I meet with people one-on-one, but, you know, there's only so many of those folks you can, you know, I have... Somebody asked me for an appointment the other day, and I said, well, that's awesome. I'm hoping I can get to you by the end of May, and it may be, if not, it may be in September. And so it's, uh, that's just how my schedule is. So, uh, so I thought, what if we got a whole bunch of people together and we could do this? And so we asked if you had questions. This is 12 pages worth of questions that you submitted, and uh, we answered some of them last week, and today we're going to answer some more. And we probably won't get to all of them, but hopefully we'll get to quite a few, and you'll find it interesting, even if it wasn't your question that we're answering tonight. So, uh, but let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Oh God, how grateful we are to you for everything. Such a beautiful day today for the world that we live in, the the beauty of the earth, the cosmos that you have made, for the chance to be here together, for your love and grace. And we pray that you would open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what you have for us tonight. I pray that you will help me to speak, uh, speak words that will be helpful to people and that together we will have grown in our faith and maybe we'll go away with more questions and answers and that's okay too. So guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. And uh, I want to mention, too, you know, the aim, like, uh, uh, there used to be a radio program on, maybe it still is on Chris Radio, called The Bible Answer Man, and he was supposed to have all the answers to everything. <laughs> Nobody has all the answers to everything. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I've taken your questions and try to think, okay, what is my best thinking on this? And I'm just going to tell you up front, I could be wrong, uh, and that's okay. I'm just going to give you my best thoughts, and my best thoughts may change a week from now if I thought about it a little harder. But I did want to spend a little time uh, trying to go through some of the questions that you had. So I'm going to begin, and actually this is where I need to look something up right here. Hold on a minute. This is our United Methodist Book of Discipline. And this book is something that we perfect every, uh, every couple of years, actually every four years at General Conference. And one of you asked, what is, the, what is our church's stance on abortion? And Church of the Resurrection, uh, our stance is in essence the United Methodist Book of Discipline stance. And the United Methodist Book of Disciplines on some things, like our social principles, gives you permission to disagree. Um, And so what we try to do, we're a church or a denomination that is largely a church of the broad middle with people on the left and the right. And so we're Democrats and Republicans, we're liberals and conservatives, and uh, and when you get right down to it, when it comes time to agree about anything, it's kind of hard to do that. And so we argue and we debate and we try to find some middle ground that holds together this side and that side, and, and that's what we've done uh, when it comes to abortion as well. So I'm going to read to you from our United Methodist Social Principles, and uh, this position is not going to change significantly in 2024, which is our next general conference. Um, but there may be some d- slight differences in the wording, but not a lot. And this is what it says. The beginning of life and the ending of life are the God-given boundaries of human existence. While individuals have always had some degree of control over when they would die, they now have the awesome power to, ter- to determine when and, and, and even whether new individuals will be born. So we think about birth control, which previous centuries did not have access to in the same way that we do. They had it, but not quite the same way we do today. And, uh, and so uh, our belief, this is the United Methodist Social Principles, our belief in the sanctity of unborn human life makes us reluctant to approve abortion. Now, this was written in 1972, so you can kind of do the math and see where we are as a society in 1972. Um, but we are equally bound to respect the sacredness of the life and well-being of the mother and the unborn child. We recognize tragic conflicts of life with life that may justify abortion, and in such cases, we support the legal option of abortion under proper medical procedures by certified medical providers. We support parental, uh, parental, guardian, or other responsible adult notification and consent before abortion can be performed on girls who have not yet reached the age of legal, adult, legal adulthood. We cannot affirm abortion as an acceptable means of birth control, and we unconditionally reject it as a means of gender selection or eugenics. We oppose the use of late-term abortion, known as dilation and extraction or partial birth abortion, and call for the end of this practice except when the physical life of the mother is in danger and no other medical procedure is available, or in the case of severe fetal anomalies incompatible with life. 
This procedure shall be performed only by certified medical providers. Before providing these services, abortion providers should be required to offer women the option of anesthesia. We call all Christians to, do, to a searching and prayerful inquiry into the sorts of conditions that may cause them to consider abortion. We entrust God to provide guidance, wisdom, and discernment to those facing an unintended pregnancy. The church shall offer ministries to reduce unintended pregnancies. We commit our church to continue to provide nurturing ministries to those who terminate a pregnancy, to those in the midst of a crisis pregnancy, and to those who give birth. We mourn and are committed to promoting the diminishing of high abortion rates. The church shall encourage ministries to reduce unintended pregnancies, such as comprehensive age-appropriate sexuality education and advocacy in regard to contraception and supportive initiatives that, en that enhance the quality of life for all women and girls around the globe. Young adult women disproportionately face situations in which they feel they have no choice due to financial, educational, relational, or other circumstances beyond their control. The church and its local congregations and campus ministries should be in the forefront of supporting existing ministries and developing new ministries that help such women in their communities. They should also support those crisis pregnancy centers and pregnancy resources, uh, centers that are compatible, compassionately helping women explore all options related to unplanned pregnancy. We particularly encourage the church, the government, and social services agencies to support and facilitate the option of adoption. We affirm and encourage the church to assist the ministries of crisis pregnancy centers and pr pregnancy resource centers that compassionately help women find feasible, uh, feas feasible alternatives to abortion. Government laws and regulations do not provide all the guidance required by the informed Christian conscience. Therefore, a decision concerning abortion should be made only after thoughtful and prayerful consideration by the parties involved with medical, family, pastoral, and other appropriate counsel. Um, and then it, uh, there's a section on ministry with people who've had an abortion and how important that is, and that the church is not rejecting people, and lo but loving and caring for people. So you can see and you can kind of hear in that the two sides of our denomination. You can hear the more progressive side that's saying that we need to have a legal right for abortion and that there are times where there are tragic conflicts of life with life, and the idea that we don't support abortion as a means of birth control or gender selection, and it doesn't satisfy anybody. So the left and the right are both unhappy with certain parts of that uh, policy or that statement, but generally it tries to find some way a middle way that charts a course. And this again emerged in 1972 in the time of Roe v. Wade and coming out of a period of time where there were many people who knew women who had had abortions that were not legal and not safe and said, we have to do something better. We have to do something different. So anyway, if you wanna know what's Church of the Resurrection's policy, we don't have one except we look to the social principles and say, this is a pretty good guidance for us and is not perfect. And it doesn't speak quite as clearly to what's going on today as it did a few years back, because there are a whole lot of other uh, situations that are not taken into account there, including emergency contraception or emergency uh, you know, pills that we can take, uh, my meth methoprestone, I'm saying it wrong, but anyway, um, the, what used to be called plan B or the morning after pill and some of those kinds of things. So uh, my own view of this, we had a really great conference here last fall, and we had people, I interviewed both the woman from the, uh, who was one of the leaders of the local crisis counseling center that was, uh, you know, doing everything they could to make sure that abortions didn't happen, and I interviewed the woman who is in charge of the local, um, I'm sorry, the name slipped my mind, Planned Parenthood, and had a chance to go to both of these places to have a chance for them to share with me why, what motivated them, what drove them, what they were trying to accomplish. And, uh, and we had some really excellent speakers in that. You can find that online as well. Um, I have described myself, and these terms don't really work anymore because they, they're almost meaningless, but uh, pro-life with a heavy heart. And by that, what I meant by that was, and generally I agree with the statement that abortion is not something that we should be using for birth control, which often it is used as, as, as a means of birth control, uh, certainly not for gender, gender selection. And at the same time, I meet with people who are in very difficult places and who are, whether it's uh, finding out that the, you know, that the, the fetus doesn't have uh, a brain that would be compatible with life and trying to figure out what do we do and we're six months pregnant or you know, situations that are just very hard and difficult. And so in those situations, I, have, I support you know, persons who are, uh, and here's what I've said, especially if it's a, it's a fetal abnormality, I've said, you know, I'm not having to walk in your shoes. So you have to make the decisions you're making. I can only tell you about children who've been born at resurrection and maybe they only lived a day and what that was like to minister with their families. And that, that actually in those situations there was a dignity and a beauty in that. And I can tell you about children who are in our Matthews ministry who, might, who doctors had said they're not gonna be worthy, of, you know, their life will not be worthy of living because of the condition they're gonna be in. And yet Matthew 
Joyner, the founder of our Matthews ministry in our stained glass window, was one of those that the doctor said his, his won't be a life worth saving. And I said, you know, but his parents thought differently about that. And so it's, a, you know, it's, and, and part of what we know is that this, like almost every, you know, controversial issue, there are places on both sides where somebody has an important truth, and we often don't listen to each other in those truths, and we try to, you know, we try to make a sort of simple uh, solution. And I would say, I don't know anybody who, there may be out there, but I don't know anybody who goes, abortion's just an awesome idea and everybody should have one. Um, and I think all of us are in some sense pro-life. And uh, so it's complicated. And, uh, and at the same time, as many of you know, um, when I was, uh, well, uh, you know, my mother... Uh, was one who was pregnant when she was a junior in high school at Shawnee Mission East and became pregnant as a result of a uh, high school party that had no parental supervision in, of all places, Leewood, Kansas, about four miles down the road. And, uh, and at the time, you couldn't finish high school if you were pregnant, so once she began to show, she had to drop out of high school. And my grandfather was a pilot with TWA and wanted to fly her to Sweden. Sweden or Switzerland? Switzerland. Wanted to fly her to Switzerland because he wanted her to go to, wanted her to, go to college and had dreams for his daughter. And, uh, and my mother you know, was raised where that was not, you didn't do that. And my grandmother, who was Catholic on my dad's side, was just, you know, this is just not right. And uh, I don't know what my mom could have been or done with her life if I had not been born. Uh, instead, she became a high school dropout and um, did really well for herself, all things considered. Um, but I wouldn't be here today had she decided to go to Switzerland. And so, you know, that's another piece of my story. It's different than somebody else's story. Um, so, again, we're a place where there's a lot of grace, and we're a place that says we should take seriously this idea of this miracle of birth that's developing, and there are situations that are complex. And, if, and this is one thing I have said, is if somebody's going to have an abortion, the earlier that you can have that to terminate the pregnancy, the better, because the longer that the fetus develops the greater, the, the, the more serious the ethical and moral repercussions are of terminating a pregnancy. And so, anyway, and I actually think that's where a lot of people are in our country, is to say we recognize these tragic conflicts of life with life. We may not be clear exactly what constitutes that. And if there's an abortion going to happen, let's have it sooner rather than later. And let's make, let's make birth control readily available to all people as opposed to some churches who say you can't use birth control except natural planning and then want to say and champion no abortions too. It seems like you need to decide. Are we going to help women uh, in being able to prevent pregnancies? And if, they are going to become, if they're going to have a pregnancy that isn't one that they wished, how are we going to support them along the way if they're going to choose to continue to have that child? All right, so there you go. Uh, if a child is not baptized as a child through no fault of their own, will they go to hell? No. So baptism doesn't save us. It's God's grace that rescues us or saves us. And children, in God's eyes, though they are born with a bent to sin, we talk about original sin, and there's a lot of debate about what exactly constitutes original sin or what is meant by that term. But when, uh, well, we talked a lot about hell last week, and so I don't want to repeat all that, but I just want to say when God looks at a baby who dies or a child that dies, I do not believe that in God's grace and mercy and the way he looks at children, and we have a real clear picture of how much God loves children through what Jesus says, when he says, allow the little children to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. And so the idea that if you were not baptized as a child uh, through no fault of your own, or even if it, well, of course, no baby is deciding whether they're getting baptized, no, you are not going to hell for that. So Catholics didn't say that either. What they said is that you went to limbo, uh, which was sort of this place where I don't even fully understand what limbo was. I used to know and I've forgotten. But it's sort of like where you went if you weren't baptized, but maybe somewhere along the way, God's grace is working in your life in limbo and you eventually make your way to heaven. I, that's at least how I'd like to interpret it. Um, why is baptism important? Baptism is an outward and visible sign of a covenant that God makes with us and we with God. And promises are important to us. And there are times, you know, Martin Luther, the great reformer, he would struggle with depression at times, and he would struggle with overwhelming feelings of guilt. And then he would look in the mirror, in the looking glass, and he would remind himself, Martin Luther, you are baptized. You belong to God. God claimed you as his child. That promise meant something, that that promise came from God, and he'd accepted, or his parents had accepted that promise on his behalf, and he'd accepted it in confirmation that he was a child of God. And so, uh, can you go to heaven without being baptized? Yes. 
But baptism is a, is, a, is a way for God to convey to us his grace. So we talk about it as a sacrament or a mystery or a means of grace by which God's grace is poured into our lives. And if you belong to resurrection, you probably have one of these shower tags. They're available in the bookstore if, if any of you are interested. But uh, we created these for a sermon that I did on baptism 15 years ago. And it's something you hang in your shower. And the prayer says this, Lord, as I enter the water to bathe, I remember my baptism. Wash me by your grace. Fill me with your spirit. Renew my soul. I pray that I might live as your child today and honor you in all that I do. And you know when we stumble and fall and we blow it, God promised in our baptisms to forgive us. I mean, that's like a powerful thing to me. Like, God, you promised when I was baptized that you would wash me clean and make me new, and I need that again now. And so that promise is just a really important idea, I think, for us. And it's an opportunity for us, if we're older, you know, and we're not infants, it's an opportunity for us to proclaim our faith in Christ as well. So we are both accepting his grace, but we're also professing that we seek to follow him. If we're baptized as a baby, then our parents and our Sunday school teachers teach us what that means to be baptized, and at confirmation, we publicly profess our own faith in Christ. The question wasn't asked, but, but uh, I know some people wrestle with this idea, well, wait, isn't baptism something that you're deciding, and so how can a baby decide to be baptized? And it's interesting, and I, I remember meeting once with a guy, and he was there with his sister, and his sister was having uh, her little infant baptized, and this guy was, he was like this the whole time. He was kind of gruff and, you know, big beard. And he was like, looking at me like he was mad at me. And I'm like, you don't go to a Methodist church, do you? Nope, I'm Baptist. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I said, you don't believe in baptizing babies? Nope, it's not in the Bible. And I said, uh, I said well, we could argue a little bit about that. Because baptism traces, for Christians, it, it in some ways replaced circumcision. Which was done on the eighth day after a child was born. They didn't know what they were doing. So on the eighth day after they were born, they were circumcised, and that was, a, that was a sign that they had become a child of the covenant, right? And so from that point on, they were a b'nai b'rit, a child of the covenant. And then they would grow into that covenant, and eventually, by the time of Jesus, or maybe sometime not long after that, I can't remember when, uh, when uh, uh, what do you call it, their Jewish version of confirmation. Bar mitzvah, thank you, a bar mitzvah. So bar mitzvahs came before bat mitzvahs did, but a bar mitzvah was a way of, of having a young person profess this faith and accept it for themselves that they had been circumcised into. And so for Christians, circumcision and baptism are, are somewhat related already. So you've got this idea on the eighth day after a child was born. Then you get to the uh, book of Acts, and I think it's Acts chapter 15 where Paul is in Philippi, and the Philippian jailer decides that he wants to follow Jesus, and he and his entire family or his entire household are baptized. And the term that's used typically would include children who are there. And so because of the faith of the Philippian jailer, his entire family were baptized. So you've got this idea, there's two of these examples in the New Testament. But, um, but this is what I said to the man who was sitting there gruffly. I said, so you don't baptize infants, and I understand that. And, I, and, and there was a time I didn't think that this was the right thing to do. I was in a little Pentecostal church, and I wasn't sure I, I agreed with this. But I said, let me tell you, uh, you know, at what age were you, did you become a Christian? He said, well, I, I kind of grew up in the church. I was like, you know, but I, I mean, I professed my faith at a certain point. I said, but but your parents were Christians, right? Yep. Did you go to church from the time you were a baby? Yep. So it seems like to me that you were growing into the Christian faith little by little. You were dedicated by your parents, not baptized, but little by little you were growing into the faith. And this is the idea, you know, the ideal for your niece is that she's going to be baptized and little by little, day by day, she's growing into her baptism and she comes to know that she belongs to Jesus. And, and if, if it's done right and the parents and everybody else has done their job, she's going to be becoming a Christian day by day. And then there'll come this day where we go through confirmation and we really make sure we understand it and then we stand before other people and we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But hopefully that's only a confirmation of what's already true in that person's life. And so uh, if you think about Christianity as a whole today, um, Roman Catholics baptize infants. That's about, a th about 40 percent of all Christians around the world. Then you add the Eastern Orthodox and they baptize infants. They actually dunk the baby all the way in the water and, and pull them out. And, uh, and then all of the mainline Christians baptize infants. And so you really have the evangelical churches that don't baptize infants. And, uh, and so the vast majority of Christians do practice this. Um, but we have people who decide not to, and they decide to wait until their kids are older. And we say, you know, that's okay. We'd love for you to baptize your infant, but, you know, we can pray for them and, and commit them to God's care. And then, you know, you can do as your, you know, as your preference is to do. But this is what we officially teach is uh, that we are... You know, that this is a sign of God's covenant with us and we with God, even before we know to reach out. And by the way, God's grace is reaching out to us before we even decide to respond to God's grace. We call that God's provenient grace.
All right, so next question. This is a really interesting one. Uh, this is, um, uh, I wanted Pastor Adam's insights on the Gospel of Thomas and other writings of in individuals that follow Jesus but that are not in the Bible. And then there was another question about the Gnostic Gospels. Uh, what are the Gnostic Gospels? Are these the same as the hidden books of the Bible? What do they contain and is there any truth to them? So let's talk about that for just a second. So the scriptures that we have in our Bible are the only scriptures, actually, there's probably two or three others that, are, that could be said to be dated to the first century. But most of the books in our New Testament, 27 books, and they're not books, they're letters and gospels, the book of Acts and the book of Revelation, but these date pretty much to the first century, the earliest strata of the Christian life. When, when Christians began uh, you know, trading writings around that they thought were helpful, they were trading first the letters of Paul. So the earliest letters in your, in your New the earliest documents in your New Testament were the letters of Paul, starting around 40, 49 A.D. The first gospel, Mark, was probably written between 65 and 70, maybe 71 or 72, somewhere in that vicinity. Luke and Matthew follow that, and John follows that. The book of Revelation follows that. The book of Acts was written at the same time as the gospel of Luke. So maybe 2 Peter might date to the 2nd century. Um, Revelation generally is thought to be before the end of the first century. So these are the earliest documents written by Christians to Christians. There were a few others. There's a, a book called the Didache, which is, uh, was called the Teachings of the Twelve. And it was describing how Christians practice their faith. And some people think it was written before the end of the first century, though most think it was written in the first decades of the second century. So these books were either associated with an apostle, said to be written by an apostle, somebody who knew an apostle, and they were found to be helpful by the earliest church and believed the Holy Spirit was speaking through them. And hence they become, they ultimately are gathered in collections. The, the epistles are gathered, the, the gospels begin, begin circulating separately. Before the end of the second century, they're gathered together. And finally, the New Testament is, is compiled. There was some debate in the early church about some books, like the Gospel of Barnabas was one of those. And there's several others that the church debated. Okay, we think this might have actually been written by Barnabas, but we're not really sure. And it's got some good stuff in it. Well, eventually the church said, you know, there's not enough parts of the church that are using this book. And we're going to say it's a good thing to read, but we don't think it was actually written in the first century. Then there's a whole bunch of books that are just really fascinating and that almost nobody in the early church thought were, you know, were actually authentic. They were written in the name of you know, certain people, uh, you know, people in the New Testament, but they were not really considered to be authentic. And some of those you know, tell us stories of what Jesus did when he was a kid. Like there's a time where he's helping his dad in the woodworking shop and, uh, and his dad cuts a two, by, well, not a two by four, but whatever it was, he cuts it a little short and Jesus goes up and he stretches it out. You know, and he's just a kid. I mean, that's a cool, fun story, but you know, probably didn't happen. And then there's another time where Jesus takes a clay, you know, a clay bird and turns it into a living bird and maybe the bird had died and he reanimates the bird. And, and then there's these kids that are making fun of him. And as, he, as uh, they do, then Jesus curses one of them and his kids get really sick. And then he, I think he eventually dies and his parents are mad. And, you know, and it's like, okay, most of that stuff, when you read it, you go, yeah, this just doesn't sound the same as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, but it does capture the fancy of the early church in wanting to say, what happened in those years that we have nothing in the Gospels to tell us about what Jesus did? And then there's books that were written about, you know, Mary. Uh, so what's Mary's backstory? And what's Joseph's backstory? And so there's a book called the Proto-Evangelium of James, or the Pre-Gospel of James, in which James, the brother of Jesus, or at least the Gospels, uh, the New Testament makes him to be the brother or half-brother of Jesus, uh, he is describing Joseph, his dad, and what he was like. And then, you know, Jesus is there at the bedside when Joseph dies. And there's these beautiful stories. And so those are written in the, in the 100s, 200s, 300s. And, uh, and some of those, like the Gospel of Thomas, some people think it could have actually been written at the end of the first century, but probably more likely in the second century. The Gospel of Thomas is the one, uh, one of these books that people have really debated, maybe modern people have debated, maybe it should be in there. Now, that, I'm going to put that on pause for a second. And if you're not totally confused yet, um, there is a movement that's taking place towards the end of the first century, a philosophical movement that has a strong appeal for some Christians, some Greek Christians, called Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word, <clears throat> comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And so there's this idea that there was this secret knowledge, and you could attain that secret knowledge. And there's some places uh, uh, in the New Testament where you could find sort of hints at this or places where they could draw. The Gospel of John sounds most like the Gnostic philosophies of the second century. Um, there's little hints in there that you can find the beginnings of this kind of thinking. 
And so, uh, so there, there was this secret knowledge, and only certain people could have it. And their doctrines, you know, they, they embraced Jesus. Most of the Gnostics embraced Jesus, or many of them did. Um, but they changed the gospel up just a little bit. So let's say the Old Testament. We struggle with why the God of the Old Testament somehow seems to be mean. Sometimes Christians say that. You know, we look and see there's these things that just seem like kind of less than the God Jesus talks about in the New Testament. And we have ways of explaining that as Christians, but the Gnostics explain it that there was the God who made every, not the God who made everything, there is the God who is sort of before everything else. And then there are beings, there are spiritual beings beneath God. And then there's one of these whose name was Yahweh who decided to make the material world. And so according to at least one strata of Gnosticism, there is the real God who is good and spiritual and and then there is Yahweh, who is the God who looks like the Old Testament God, and this is their way of dealing with the differences here. And they believe that spirit is good and flesh is bad. And some of them believe that Jesus um, only appeared to be in the flesh, or he, or he basically kind of borrowed a body, but he was really just a spiritual being. And he didn't really die on the cross. <clears throat> it appeared he died. <clears throat> Excuse me, it appeared he died on the cross, but he was a spiritual being because spirit was good and flesh was bad. That's at least how some Gnostics thought about things. So anyway, they had this secret knowledge. They had ways of Jesus talking about things. They had, you know, they had Jesus maybe getting married to Mary Magdalene. Um, and by the way, so if you ever read, what was Dan Brown's, The Da Vinci Code? How many of you read that book? <clears throat> a lot of you did. Fun book to read. Terrible Bible, you know, in theology, really. <clears throat> and it's not the idea that Jesus married Mary Magdalene. That wouldn't have been a bad idea in the first century because, you know, it's kind of a myth that Jesus didn't get married. If you were a Jewish man and you didn't get married by a certain age, there's something wrong with you, most people thought. So there would have been no problem. If Jesus had gotten married, great. You know, the gospel story would have been told that way. It's just that it wasn't told that way in the first century. It was told that way in the third century or maybe, this, maybe the later in the second century. And so, you know, it gets, that shows up in one of these books. And the Gospel of Thomas has a, doesn't talk about that, but it has a little, uh, like, God, like Jesus was going to make Mary into a man so she could be a disciple. I mean, it's kind of an odd thing. But anyway, the Gospel of Thomas, Thomas starts off, these are the secret sayings of Jesus. Now, anytime you find something that says it's a secret, you probably should raise your, you know, just raise it up just a little bit. Like Jesus wanted the whole world to know, so why are there these secret sayings? And some of them sound like the Jesus in the Gospels, and some of them are parallels to the things that Jesus said in the Gospels, but some of them are very different from that. And when you read it, you go, yeah, this just doesn't quite sound like Jesus in the Gospels, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, that's part of the problem we have with John's Gospels. He also doesn't sound like Jesus in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John uh, has Jesus speaking a little bit differently. Anyway, so, uh, so there are a number of these books that are out there. Um, they date typically from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. And the church is gradually sort of sifting through and debating, okay, does this sound like Jesus? Is this, what's, the, what's the, you know, authenticity of this book? Uh, does the things that Jesus does, do they, do they sound like the Jesus we find in the Gospels? And eventually the church says, no, uh, some of these are okay to read. Some of them shouldn't be read because their theology is way off. And so you find that some of these sects end up, uh, some of them are in Egypt, some of them uh, find their way into Greece. Eventually they kind of die out. And this is where there's a lot of debate in the early church. This is where some of the early heresy debates come in and what constitutes authentic Christianity. And so early on, uh, the church is beginning to talk about what are the things we really believe. And by the end of the second century, by the end of the 100s, we have the Apostles' Creed. It was called the Roman Symbol. And generally what we find in the, in the Apostles' Creed was there. And then later on, by 325, we had the Nicene Creed. And it defines even more clearly, you know, based upon the, you know, the debates that were going on, it defines a little more clearly who Jesus is. Then the Chalcedonian Creed in the, fourth, or in the 5th century. So the church begins to kind of clarify what are our sacred books and, uh, and what is it that we really believe. So I have plenty of these books in my library. I have, I think, most of them in one book or another. I enjoy reading them. I find them fascinating. Um, but my faith isn't undermined by the fact that they're out there. If you understand the history of them, you go, oh, that's really interesting. There were a lot of different people out there thinking about Jesus, and they had different ideas about Jesus, and the church sort of codified. These are the things that we believe over a period of time. And the Gospel of Thomas has some good stuff to read in it, but it doesn't, at least it doesn't smell, well, smell, it doesn't look like an authentic Gospel of Jesus uh, or Gospel about Jesus when you compare them, compare it to the others. All right, more than you wanted to know about this. By the way, there are little note cards in the seat back of the chair in front of you. If anyone, anyone wants to write anything down, you can, because I know already you're like, okay, that's way more than I can even remember here. So, but here we go. We're going to go into a few more questions. Actually, quite a few more questions. So, let's see this one. 
Uh, this one had to do with Judas, and this is a really great question. So uh, the question was, so did Jesus know that Judas was going to betray him when he called him to be his disciple? Did Jesus call him anticipating that Judas would sell him out for 30 pieces of silver so that he would die? Which leads to some other deeper questions like, did Jesus know he was going to die at the age of 33 from the time he was a kid? or when he called his disciples. He certainly seems to have known that it was likely he was going to die, but was it clear to him that Judas was the one who was going to betray him? And you say, well, Jesus knows everything. Well, when did he he come to know everything? Did he know everything when he was a baby? Have you ever seen those paintings of Jesus in in the manger, and he looks like he has all the knowledge in the world in his eyes, like he already knows everything? Did Jesus have to learn to talk? Did he have to learn to walk, or did he walk from the moment he was a baby, or he had muscles enough to do it? Could he speak all the languages of the world when he was six months old, or just a few of them, or maybe none of them yet, right? And, and so when we look at, you know, we believe that God became flesh in Jesus, but in Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, he says, but God emptied himself of his, or, you know, Jesus emptied himself of his divinity to become human. So at some point, he, you know, he continues to gain knowledge, insight, understanding, but I don't know whether Jesus knew when he called Judas that he was going to betray him. Maybe he did, and maybe he didn't. But along the way, you know, he puts Judas in charge of the money. And one of the Gospels tells us that Judas would help himself to the money from time to time. Why did Judas Judas begin following Jesus? That's one of the really big questions, right? And I love uh, Jesus Christ Superstar and Godspell both try to, you know, address this. And it appears as though Judas, you know, was somebody who really wanted to get rid of the Romans. And he was expecting the Messiah to lead an army to get rid of them. And Jesus was a major disappointment to him because he kept talking about loving your enemies and turning the other cheek. And when he came to Jerusalem and and Judas is thinking, you know, now finally he's going to raise up the army and instead he doesn't do it, then it looks like Judas decided at that moment, you know, I've had enough. I've wasted three years of my life with this guy. I actually love him, but right now I just can't stand him. And... uh, for whatever reason, I mean, the scripture says the devil put it in his heart, but he sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver and betrays him at the very last. And Jesus, by this time, knows it's going to happen. Jesus knows people's hearts. He knows it's going to happen. Uh, so, so when I look at this, I don't think that Jesus... So here was part of the question. Um, you know, if, if this was necessary all along, then, you know, why does the scripture take a, such a hard look at Judas? Why, why does the scripture take, you know, just speak about Judas in pretty negative terms? And, uh, and though he fulfills an important part of God's plan, it could have been fulfilled some other way if Judas had remained faithful. And so, but interestingly enough, you know, in the scriptures, it really doesn't take a terribly, you know, Jesus says a harsh thing to him here or there, but at the very end, but even then he, you know, Jesus shares his bread with him at the last supper and has him sit right next to him, right? And, and the question I always ask, and I preached a sermon on this once is, you know, Judas goes after he sees that Jesus is arrested and he knows he's going to die. Judas feels great regret and he throws the 30 pieces of silver back to the priests. And then he goes out in a field and at least one of the accounts, he hangs himself. In another one, he, he, uh, his bowels burst forward. And you can try to m- make those say the same thing. But in any case, Judas feels great regret. And the question I always think about is, what would have happened if Judas had waited three days? If he just waited three days from that moment of the darkest moment of his life where he feels such overwhelming guilt and sorrow, what if he just waited three days, just actually from Friday to, to Sunday, 36 hours? Don't you think if, if he'd waited 36 hours and he saw the risen Christ and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and said, Jesus, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. What do you think Jesus would have done? I think he would have forgiven him too. Can you imagine the testimony Judas would have had traveling around the world and say, I sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. I was the one who put him on the cross, and he forgave even me. Right? Anyway, I just find an interesting thought, thought question. But, um, but I think Jesus was aware going into the cross or you know, going into Jerusalem what Judas was going to do. He knew he was stealing money from the common purse. And I think he still loved Judas. I think he still loved him to the end. All right, does human life exist on planet Earth, uh, only on planet Earth, uh, knowing other galaxies with planets were created by God? Do you know how many possible planets there are in the Milky Way galaxy alone? Um, It's estimated, perhaps, that there are 300 million planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone, and that's just our galactic neighborhood. So we're in a solar system with the sun, and we know the planets around the sun, but the Milky Way is 
400, you know, what is it, 400 million, uh, you know what, I may actually have this wrong. Uh, so the, the Milky Way has somewhere between two and 400 million stars, and around those stars they think there could be one, on average, one to 10 planets, and so some have estimated there could be as many as a trillion planets in our solar, in our, galaxy, in our Milky Way galaxy, but the latest numbers that I saw were around 400, 300 to 400 million planets. Now that's just our, our galaxy, and uh, the number of galaxies that are out there are somewhere, we think, between 100 million and 200 million uh, galaxies. And so you begin to get the idea that there's, if there's 100 million and they all have 300 million planets around them, uh, you've got an awful lot of potential planets out there. Now most of them are so far away that you couldn't ever get here in the lifespan of a particular species, probably. But, uh, but within 30 light years of planet Earth, there are planets that could potentially, with some you know, hyper-advanced technology, be able to get to planet Earth. Do I think there's probably life on other planets in our galaxy? Yes. It would be hard to imagine that there wasn't. But in order for life to develop, it's astronomic, the odds are astronomically against it. So, I mean, it, it really is a miracle in itself that life developed on our planet. But I have to think with 300 million options out there, there's probably some places out there where it develops. So then the question is, so like, do they know God? What are they like? Did Jesus come to them on their planet? You know, how has God appeared to them? And, and those are really great questions. C.S. Lewis wrote a trilogy, a science fiction trilogy some years ago, trying to answer these very questions. And, uh, and so would the gospel have unfolded the way the gospel unfolded here in Jesus uh, if, if there was another you know, species that was humanoid of some kind, maybe, um, or maybe God said, you know, this is what happened on earth and I'm going to tweak things just a little bit and see if it could be better. And, uh, but what I'm confident of is that somehow in a way that they could recognize Jesus would have come to them. God would have come to them in a way they could recognize. They wouldn't have called him Jesus. They would have called him something else, but that God would have come to them in a way that they could understand and comprehend because God longs to be known and God loves his creation. And so I'm pretty sure if there's other species out there like ours on other planets, God loves those aliens too. And so it'd be interesting to see what happens. I was just reading something this week, you know, the whole UFO thing, and I was reading something in the Atlantic that was talking about, you know, the, the, you know, the, the folks who believe that there are um, UFOs, or what do they call them now? It's some other term, but uh, that have, you know, been spotted here increasing, in increasing numbers. And, uh, and that may be true, and it may be totally hogwash because we humans love to believe stuff that, you know, either scares us or we find interesting. But, um, I, you know, I think at some point we may very well meet, you know, somebody from another, you know, another race on another planet. And if that happens, the question is, will we be so afraid that we're going to just try to destroy them? Or will we be remembering the words of Jesus and think maybe our neighbor is also the alien somewhere else? And my hunches will be so terrified that we're going to do everything we can to destroy them. Anyway, uh, so, uh, by the way, there's no chapter and verse in the Bible that says anything about this. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just making stuff up at this point, but I do think it's kind of interesting to, to think about. Um, how do we manage family and friends who tell us we're going to hell if we don't think, feel uh, the same way they do on any particular subject? And, uh, you know, this is really interesting. It's hard, and even if they're not thinking you're going to hell... We can have serious disagreements about things, politics or uh, religion or sexuality, and it is so hard for us to get along with people who see things very differently than we do. And we naturally put up our defenses, and we find if, we, you know, if, if we're at Thanksgiving meal, we decide we don't want to ever eat Thanksgiving again at that person's house. Um, you know, I, I've known parents who, couldn't, who wouldn't talk to their children and children who wouldn't talk to their parents because they seriously disagree about issues. And um, so here's the answer, I think, is Jesus told us to love our enemies. Now, the thing is, the person who sees things differently on human sexuality or Black Lives Matter or whatever, they're not your enemy. They're your fellow humans, right? But even if they were your enemy, you're called to love them. And I don't see any, I don't see any way out of the current morass we're in than somehow looking at people and trying to give them the benefit of the doubt and trying to love them even if you disagree. And you don't, have to, you don't have to give in on what you believe, but you do have to say, but I care about you even if we disagree. And sometimes our feelings get hurt. You know, I maybe told you this last week, LaVon, I received a letter from a 40-year friend of ours, 
And, and we, weren't, we weren't that close, but, uh, but she said, I'm not going to be your friend anymore because of what Adam and Church of the Resurrection teach about LGBTQ people and welcoming everybody. And so I feel like I have to separate myself from the evil. That's what she said. We were the evil that, that they have to be separated from, you know. And, and, you're, and, and I think the other term was, you're a cancer, you know, and we need to separate ourselves from the cancer. I'm like, whoa, seriously? So this is what humans tend to do to each other. And so we have to decide how do I respond to that. And the way we respond to that is say, you know, we're really sorry you feel that way, but we still love you. We disagree, but we still love you. And I think this was Dr. King, you know, when at one of his sermons uh, in the book Strength to Love was so powerful when he says, you know, you, you can, and I'm making, I'm paraphrasing, you can attack our children and we're still going to love you. You can bomb our homes and we're still going to love you. But we're going to wear you down by our capacity to love. And one day, we're going to win a double victory as, as you come to accept that love and come to love as well. And so I don't know any better, I don't know any other answers to where we're at. But, you know, when that happens, it's, hurt, it's hurtful. You've got to acknowledge that too. I remember years ago, I preached a sermon. This was in 19, no, I'm sorry, it was in 2004. And I preached a sermon that upset a lot of people around human sexuality and just trying to say, I see this differently than I used to see it. And I could be wrong, but this is, you know, we're going to be a church that's going to welcome people. We're going to love them. And, and uh, you don't all have to agree with me. It's okay. But uh, when I read scripture, this is the bigger message of scripture that I see. And I've met with a lot of these folks and I care about them and, and I want to be their pastor. I want this to be their church family. And there was, I think there were 800 people who left the church in the eight months after that. And uh, I have never experienced something so painful personally. And that was, and I, and I you know, LaVon said, well, imagine what it's like to be somebody in their families who's gay or lesbian. I mean, you're just getting emails from people leaving the church. And, um, and so, uh, anyway, and I remember thinking, I've, I shared this with some of you before, but I remember after about six months of being deeply depressed, and I don't get depressed very often, and every day I'd wake up and I'd pray, God, did I get this wrong? Did I misunderstand you? Please forgive me if I did, but you know, I just don't, I, I think you love these people, and it's not only that you love them, but I think you understand, you know, and, and again, as a church, we, did, we have 70-30. We're divided on gay marriage and some other things. But, but generally, we've said, but we're going to love everybody. And I think most people want to love everybody, even if they're more conservative on this. I think they say, we want to love everybody. But, you know, at that time, I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be the pastor here anymore. I kept, and finally, I went to, we were mucking out our barn. We have a, did I tell you this last week? Okay. So we, have a, we live out at, uh, in Stillwell, and we have a barn, an old barn built in the 1800s. And we had a couple horses at that time. And I remember I was out in the barn, and at this time I'm getting job offers from other places, come be the president of the seminary, or come do this, or come here, and you'll make a lot more money, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm, uh, we're out mucking out the stalls. We had these two horses, and we're cleaning them out before we put the horses in, and it was probably 10, 9 o'clock at night, I'm guessing. It was very cold, maybe in the 20s. Uh, and I turned to Levon, I said, um, would you be okay if I took another job? And she said... Um, well, tell me more. And I said, I just, my heart hurts too much to stay for 25 more years of this. And, uh, you know, I, are you okay if we do something else? And she said, well, of course, you know, if you feel God's leading you to go somewhere else or do something else, that's fine. I just have one question I want to ask you. Is God calling you to leave or are you running away? Man, I hate it when she asks questions like that. <laughs> and, and part of what I realized was that I was running away and I didn't feel like God had called me to leave. And so I stayed, and, you know, four or five months later, I began to find my joy again, you know, in what I was doing. And, and almost all the best experiences I've had in ministry have been since that moment, and I would have missed out on all of them had I left in 2004. That's a word for many of you because some of you feel like quitting or leaving right now. Family or your jobs or your church or something else. And there are times where all of us go through moments like that. And to be able to go, is God calling me to leave or am I running away? And for most of the time, I think God is not calling us to leave and we hang in there. And then we see what God does after that. Uh, so anyway, I don't, how did I get there? I don't even remember which qu question I was trying to answer. Uh, how do you deal with family or people who think this about you? And I think the answer is that you, that you love them. Um, I, had, I, had, I saved a ream of emails that I had received back in 2004, 2005, and I just saved them in my garage for years. I don't know why. I didn't even read them all, but I just thought I'm going to save these. And then uh, we were cleaning out the garage a couple years ago, and Levon says, are you ready to throw these away? We had a burn pile going. I'm like, I think I'm ready to burn them now. <laughs> and it was healthy. It was kind of, you know, kind of a good thing to 
let them go. All right, uh, I, we're making our way through a lot of questions so far, but I want you to stand and turn to somebody else and say, what did you hear so far that you thought was interesting or helpful or you disagreed with or you agreed with? Stand and take two minutes uh, to uh, connect with somebody sitting around you. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, ten. No, 30, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. Let's talk about religion and politics for a minute. So the two topics you're not supposed to talk about with anybody, and, you know, Gentile people don't talk about mixed company, is religion and politics. And you know what? I just think that's wrong. I think what's particularly wrong is not to talk about your faith, but to find a way to talk about it that instead of being um, obnoxious and uncharitable, you know, instead is a way of gently being able to say, you know, this is something that matters to me. And uh, to be able to talk about insights you have or moments that are, and to learn how to talk about your faith with people who don't have faith is really important because there are certain ways that Christians can talk that are creepy or turn other people off. It's sappy, syrupy, it, it just is a total, you know, it, it, it totally alienates non-religious people. So part of, the, part of the challenge and task, I think, for Christians is to know how to be winsome. And you know, one of the biggest things we do is just to be kind to people and caring and loving and but there's also a way to be able to say, uh, hey, you know, I go to that church over, you know, wherever your church is. Many of you are from Resurrection. You know, I go, to, I, I go to church, and the other day there was this message. We were talking about this thing, and there was a story the pastor told. And I just thought it was such a great story. Well, you know what? When you tell a story, everybody's interested in listening. But you also told them that you're a Christian, and you also told them where you go to church. Or when we do our food drives, and we go, you know, we go in our neighborhoods and knock on the doors and say, hey, we're doing a food drive. You know, if you'd like to help, we're going to, all this is going to right here in Kansas City and, you know, through our church. And, and, you know, those are just little simple ways of bearing witness to your faith. Or I walk through my neighborhood uh, fairly regularly, and I have all my neighbors' names on my notes app on my phone, and I pray for every one of them by name as I walk by their house. I stretch out my hand towards their house. And then when I see them, I say, and of course they know I'm a pastor, but I, I'm like, hey, I just want you to know, every time I walk by your house, uh, I lift you up in prayer, and I pray for your family. And it's just a small little thing. Or when they need a cup of sugar or whatever else, you just make sure that you're the neighbor who's going to give it to them so that you actually love your neighbor and not just with words. And, and you know, here's where I, and I don't think St. Francis actually said this, although it's usually attributed to him, but preach the gospel at all times and only when you have to use words. And so there's something, but sometimes you have to. You can't just be kind all the time, but then never actually let people know the reason why you're kind in part is because Christ has transformed you. And so I think... Uh, so anyway, when it comes to religion and politics, what, 
so I have people say, well, you know, you're talking about this such and such topic, and, you know, aren't you crossing the line between uh, separation of church and state? Guess what? The separation of church and state is for the state, not for the church. So uh, this is about, and this is, you know, goes back to Jefferson and others who said that the church should not be endorsing any state, any religion. We're going to be different than the European countries. We are not going to endorse a religion. We are not going to fund a religion. We are going to, uh, we're going to be neutral when it comes to the field of religion. I think that's a really healthy thing for our country. And uh, this is not about saying the church can't talk about political issues. Now, there is a, something that has to do with the tax status of a church, and it can be taken away if you're endorsing candidates. You should not be endorsing candidates in a church. And there are churches that do that, and they do it, you know, they think they're being sneaky, but it's no question who their candidates are that they're supporting. We don't do that. We have policies against that here at the church. You will never hear me endorsing a candidate at Church of the Resurrection. And, uh, but when you have people who are in office, and if they are doing things that are incompatible with the Christian faith, you should be able to say something about that too. I mean, would to God that more people in the churches had said something when Hitler was doing what Hitler was doing at the very beginning. But instead, people were afraid. They didn't say anything. And so, you know, that doesn't come up here very often. Um, and I try to be, I recognize, you know, we've got 40% Republicans and 40% Democrats and 20% um, uh, independents. And of the Republicans, we've got conservative Republicans and liberal Republicans and vice versa, you know, same thing with Democrats. Um, but when it comes to issues, we have to talk about those things. And so, you, and I, I love this, typically people will, if they're critical, it's like, well, you're being too political. Usually that means I don't agree with your moral position. Um, because what is politics? Now, if you're, again, endorsing candidates and parties, that's one thing. But if you're talking about issues, those issues are moral and ethical issues. So we don't really have, there's no place for us to talk about, you know, the Republican and Democratic parties or any other parties. There is a place for us to talk about, you know, what are moral and ethical issues. And we can disagree about what those moral and ethical issues are. But when we're talking about things that involve our world around us, you know, those are fair game for us to talk about. How does our faith speak into that? And, um, and if we don't do that, if we never take the time to talk about what's happening in our real world and how our faith should impact that, I think we have failed to be real Christians. And so, you know, what we can talk about is what are the, what are the underlying issues that we, sh we should be concerned for the poor. Now, how we address poverty, we can disagree about um, you know, we should be concerned about racial justice. How we address that, we might disagree about this. But these are things that we have to talk about. Abortion is one of those issues about which we should talk about how we think about life and how it develops and, and the ethical imperatives related to this. Um, but we might disagree about how we, you know, how we achieve that right balance between this and that. And that's one of the things I value about the United Methodist Church. We have a social principles in the front of this book in which people a lot smarter than I have over a long period of time, ethicists and, and theologians have tried to ask, so how does our faith relate to migrant workers? Or how does it relate to, you know, a, a living standard for people? Or how does it relate to the rights of women? Or how does it relate to racial divisions? And so I'm, you know, I don't, I don't agree with everything in our social principles, but I'm really proud that we have them. Even when I disagree, I'm glad that we're at least trying to ask the question, how does our faith relate to these things? And so one of the things, again, I love about the United Methodist Church, I don't have to agree with everything, but I do have to recognize that they're trying to be able to speak into what's going on in our world. And there's a lot of churches that won't do that. And I'm really proud that ours does. Um, and if you read the, we're getting ready to rework the social principles, but it's kind of a minor reworking. But uh, there's a lot of things in there that I might never have thought of before. And there's a few of them I think, I really am not sure you're right about that one. But again, I'm grateful that you're at least raising the question. And it doesn't require me to believe all those things in order to be able to say, but we want you to think about these things. And that's what I say when I'm preaching on issues that are challenging or difficult is you don't have to agree with me. But I want you to think about it at least. I want you to, to take the time to ponder, you know, how does my faith connect here? And, and over time, what I've found is there are I don't do a lot of that kind of preaching. Probably I should do more. But the, what I find is there are people, I had a guy came into my office one time and he was so smoking mad. He was just furious about something that I had said. And I'm like, well, I'm, you know, hey, tell me what you're thinking. Maybe you're right, you know? And so we sat and talked about that for a while. And 
No, I don't think you're right. But I didn't say that to him. I just said, you know, <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing with me your, your thoughts. It was really helpful to me to hear another side. And, and, um, and you know, I, and to reiterate, you know, th- these are the, this is why I believe this. And, uh, but I still love you. And I want you to be a part of the church. And I think he left the church for, I don't know, a couple years. And then one day he came back and I met him out in the narthex after church. And he said, I just wanted to apologize. A, I was a jerk. And B, you know, some things have happened in my life lately, and I've met some people, and I think you might be right. So it's hard for me to say that, but I think you might be right. And it had to do with, it had to do with people in incarceration, people who were incarcerated. And he came from an experience he'd had with somebody who'd been incarcerated, and it was a very negative thing that had happened. And so that shaped how he saw things. But then he got to know some people who he thought, you know what, somebody who I think was a coworker, And he said... I think I was wrong about that. Anyway, so, it, you know, it's kind of interesting. I saw somebody at Easter, you know, who I hadn't seen in, in years and years who I said, I'm back. And they left over something they disagreed with, but over time, and, you know, over time, my view has changed too. And that's part of life. It's part of growing is that we see things differently over time. All right, so I think we should be asking the question, how, when we watch, I've often felt this, when we watch the evening news, we should be asking, how does my, what does my faith call me to do in response to these things? Because when God works in the world, God doesn't send angels with wings. By the way, angels don't have wings, not as near as we can tell. But God doesn't send, you know, supernatural beings. God sends you. That's what we're going to talk about this weekend in the Sermon on Unanswered Prayer, is that God uses us. And so we better be asking the question, God, what, what do you want me to do in response to this thing that's happening in our world? All right, uh, this was a good question somebody asked. In the walk, you write about five practices of the Christian life. And just to remind you, that is worship and prayer. Each one has a, you know, a group component, a community component, and an individual one. Uh, you talk about worship and prayer. That's number one. You talk about study and reading scripture. You talk about uh, serving God by serving other people. You talk about giving, and that's generosity in your daily life as well as generosity towards God. And you talk about bearing witness to your faith in word and deed. And, uh, and, and they ask this, on, when it comes to the service, for lack of better words, does it count if we feel called to serve at animal shelters or environmental groups? Yes, of course. Now, what we learned last week in Genesis 1, 26 through 28 is the first commandment that God gave to humans, in case you weren't here last Sunday, the first commandment God gave to humans is to be fruitful and multiply. That sounds fun. Be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth, to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And so we're to rule over the earth, but we're to rule as God's stewards because the earth belongs to the Lord. And so taking care of this planet is an act of service. So yes, I would say very much, if you are uh, into caring for animals, if you are um, you know, working in the environment, and I hope all of us are in some ways trying to care for our environment, that's a part of being a Christian. Turn off the lights when you walk out of the room, look to see how we can be good stewards of what we have here. Uh, so yes, the answer I, I think would be yes. Okay, let's see. Oh, this is a good question. Um, why are we told to pray for healing, pray for others, pray for our country, pray for anything? My experience is that whatever is going to happen will happen, and why should I think, I think God would answer my request when he knows the beginning to the end of my life? So uh, it's an excellent question, and I'm going to answer it this Sunday in worship, so be here in church. <laughs> All right, but I, I'll give you a short answer. Jesus told us to pray for each other, and he called us to pray, and then he taught us how to pray, with the Our Father, and that's a sort of pattern prayer. And the Apostle Paul tells us to pray for each other. And so, and James tells us to pray for each other. Um, but, okay, I'm going to give you just a little hint of where I'm going this Sunday. <laughs> is, uh, I believe, and I'll make the case for this Sunday, I believe that prayer is less about giving guidance to God so that God can know what he should do because we helped him understand it. <laughs> And I think it's more about, well, first of all, I think prayer is primarily a way of fellowshipping and communing with God, more than asking for stuff. But when I'm asking for stuff or I'm naming people before God, I'm pouring out my heart to God. And I think God hears my prayers, but what I don't think is that God is in the business of usually supernaturally intervening and violating the laws of nature that God himself established in order to do something out of the ordinary. I think God's normal way of working is in our hearts and in the hearts of other people. And what, what I really believe is that much of prayer is about changing me and moving me to action. 
So I've taught you this when it comes to the Lord's Prayer. Every phrase in the Lord's Prayer, there's a Latin phrase called ora et labora. Ora is prayer and labora is work. We are to pray and we are to work. When I pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, what I'm really saying is, please use me to hallow your name. Help me in my daily living to honor you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. And when I'm praying that, I'm saying, please use me to, to help this world look more like your kingdom. Right? And give us this day our daily bread. I realize that I'm supposed to be concerned. I have enough food to eat, so I'm going to be the answer to somebody else's prayer in giving food. And this is how I think prayer often works, is it moves our hearts to be engaged with other people. It, you know, it also names before God our loved ones or ourselves and our concerns. And the Holy Spirit works. I think God works in our lives, usually by the nudges and by what God does in our hearts and in our minds. But I also don't discount the idea that there are miracles that can happen. Uh, certainly when Jesus walked on the earth, there was nothing that was really miraculous for him because he was the son of God. But I think he was pointing us towards what heaven is going to look like where we'll be completely healed. Um, so, but I do think that, that supernatural miracles can happen, but I think they're a rarity or else they wouldn't be miracles, right? What makes it a miracle is the fact that it hardly ever happens, and this is sort of stands out. And so God's normal way of working is through doctors and through friends and through people who come along, alongside our path. And so I think when I pray for someone else, it's moving my heart to action towards them. But I think it's also relieving me of a burden. I have named them before God and said, God, I love this person so much. And I know right now I'm just going to bug you about this person. And I'm going to ask you to use the doctors and nurses and their friends and other people and work in all the ways you normally do and in their body's own natural healing processes to bring deliverance. And I also don't hesitate from time to time to pray for the grand slam out of the park home run kind of miracle. And I tell people, look, this is unusual. It's not the way God normally works, but we're still going to pray for it anyway. Because scripture says sometimes you have not because you ask not. But when I do that, I do that not going to be disappointed if God doesn't supernaturally, miraculously intervene because I know that's not how God normally works. But it's still okay to ask. So that's, that would be my answer to the, what's well, really a good question. And that was several other people's questions too. Why do we pray? What does prayer actually do? Doesn't God already know the outcome? So it's prayer for our own faith. And largely it's for our own faith. But I think it's also, you know, I think there's something too. When you're hurting, you pour out your heart to God and you sense God's presence and know that he's got a hold of you. And there's something powerful and beautiful and good in that. All right. Uh, is our statement on racial justice to be modified to remove the emotional and dividing statements that are part of the document, which we produced right after George Floyd died? Uh, we are not seeming to take a balanced approach to this and other social issues that have been presented in other controversial issues. Are we still a thinking person's church? So my answer is we are a thinking person's church, and we want people to be able to think and ask questions, or else we just tell you this is how it is, and if you don't like it, don't let the door hit you in the butt on the way out. But we don't say that because it's a place for us to be able to have discussion, debate, arguments. But at the same time, if what we did was always say, look, we're only going to say stuff that everybody agrees with, we probably wouldn't ever say anything. Because we're a church that's made up of people on a broad spectrum. We try to look and see, and this is the only time we've ever put together a statement quite like that. And uh, in the aftermath of four different events that, that made their way into social media in the month of George Floyd's death, culminating in George Floyd's death, you know, part of what, and, and, you know, this is just a little tip of the iceberg for many of us believe, but you look at these things and go, the church should say something, and we're the largest church in Kansas City and the largest United Methodist Church in the country, and if we don't say anything, who will? And sometimes I think, I've been here 32 years. Doesn't mean I'm right, doesn't mean I know more than anybody else, but if I don't say anything, most pastors who've been at a little church for three years or a year and a half can't say any of these things or else they're going to be tarred and feathered or sent out sent away packing. I'm pretty sure you're not going to fire me before I resign. Some days I wish you would, but, uh, <laughs> but I don't think you're going to fire me. And so there's times where you just say, I should say something about this. Now, this statement was actually something where we asked some of our lay leaders, the chair of our church council, several of other lay leaders, uh, several of our pastors, several of our uh, people of color who are on our staff, help us think about this and what should we say that won't be mamby-pamby, but at the same time, we'll be you know, as faithful as we can be to what the gospel would call us to. So I thought I'd just share with you what the statement is. And you can see it on the screen. I'm going to put it up here. Because there are things. When, when I, so I was a part of a team that had a chance to tweak it a bit. And when you're, when you're tweaking something, you're going, okay, this, oh man, I know this is going to hit some people the wrong way. This is going to sound, it's going to make some people cringe. And then you think, maybe cringing is not bad sometimes. I wouldn't say it this way. I might say it differently. 
But maybe there's a place for us to say something that's bold enough so that people of color in Kansas City know that Church of the Resurrection isn't just a big white church out in Southern Johns County that is blind to our history as human beings. And so anyway, when, when I read the statement, you know, my initial thought was, well, let's tweak this, let's tweak that. Well, we did tweak some things in here. And I think the church council probably felt that same way. There were probably, there were some members of the church council were like, oh man, I like it, but... So my thought was initially put footnotes with it. And, uh, and you know, you know when things like this are being said, things are also changing in our society. So suddenly, you know, Black Lives Matter is mentioned in here. And before too long, Black Lives Matter became a, you know, oh, well, it's a communist organization that's doing this or that or whatever. So you realize no matter what, some things will be attacked, some things will be torn down. That's how things work today. But I'm just going to walk through it and just, uh, I'll point out some of the things that I think uh, people, you know, because I've met with a number of people who were probably five different families who were upset about this statement, and there were many more who I know were. Uh, So let's just walk through this. Uh, The Churches of the Resurrection's vision for racial justice. What does the Lord require of me but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with my God, which was on your t-shirts? We lament the murder of George Floyd and countless other black men and women whose names may or may not be widely known. We condemn the loss of these lives to violence fueled by racism and white supremacy. From slavery to Jim Crow, laws to more insidious insidious racial injustices, racism continues to harshly impact life for black Americans today. That's not true for all black Americans, but it's true for some black Americans, and it's certainly true, you know, when you... So I spent time talking with a number of our African-American members here at Resurrection, older couples who are just saintly people describing their own fears or their own life experiences or those who are teaching their kids what to and not to do in case you got stopped by police, or two of our African-American pastors who talked about being pulled over by the police, or, you know, just a whole host of things. One of our members, well, I could go on for these kind of stories, but anyway, so I don't feel it because it's not my life experience, but I trust it when somebody else tells me that some of these are their life experiences. So enough is enough, Black Lives Matter. Now, by Black Lives Matter, when we wrote this statement, um, none of us we're really thinking about an organization, and I think there were actually two organizations that tried to use that title. And uh, we were not supporting an organization. We were saying, this is a phrase that's been used again and again. It's sort of like, I am somebody when Jesse Jackson said it. Um, Or I am a man. That was the campaign in the 1960s. I am a man, where people wore their signs. And that's, in essence, we were saying, that seems to be the phrase that people are using today. We could have said, uh, Black Lives Matter to God. And if I'd known it was going to be a fuss over Black Lives Matter, we probably would have added some little tweak to it a little bit. But Black Lives Matter. Speak out on behalf, so this is a scripture again, speak out on behalf of the voiceless and for all the right, for the rights of all who are vulnerable. And that's a passage that just shapes my life. I've memorized it a long time ago, and it's just, I think, is really important. We believe that all lives can't matter until all black lives matter. Now, this is a phrase that really troubled some people. Like, wait a minute, don't all lives matter? Of course all lives matter. So what I think they were trying to say, and I would have put a footnote after this one if I could have, we believe that all lives can't matter until all black lives matter. That is, you can say all lives matter, but if black lives still don't matter, then all lives don't matter. And at the time, watching this happening, you know, story after story, and the young kid and, you know, who, was, who was shot as he was jogging on, you know, on Sunday afternoon, he was walking, you know, went into a house, and somebody thought, well, he looks like the kid who stole something from, you know, some of the neighbors around here. Well, I have a place down at the Lake of the Ozarks. They're building a neighborhood. I walk in all those houses. I want to see what they're doing. I want to see what, you know, what innovations they have in their house. That's just a normal part of what you do when there's a house that's not locked up. You, if you're walking through a neighborhood, this kid did, and he got shot to death. Like, all lives can't matter until all black lives matter. That didn't even seem that controversial to me, but it did to some people, and they, they heard it in a certain way. And so I would have put a footnote next to that one. As followers of Jesus Christ, we must condemn racism in every form. I believe that's true. Whether unconscious or conscious, systematic or arbitrary, racism is sin. I think that's, that's true as well. And it is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus, and I believe that. So this comes from the social principles. Again, we can agree or disagree with the social principles, but we recognize racism as sin and affirm the ultimate and temporal worth of all persons. Racism prevents all of us from experiencing God's kingdom here on earth. I think that's true. As Christians, we are called to demonstrate the courage and conviction to end racism. I believe that's true. Each of us must acknowledge white privilege. Now, this is a place that really was unsettling for some people because white privilege can mean different things to different people. And, and especially for people I found who said, look, I didn't have privilege. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. I grew up in poverty. I mean, I'm like, I did too. 
You know, I remember my family living in a house on 156th and Metcalf that had to be torn down. Actually, the fire department burned it down as a practice home when we moved out. Uh, we had nights where the toilets froze up and the water on my table froze up. And we had, the first night we lived there, I think I killed 18 mice the first night we lived there. My mom was dirt poor at that moment. My stepdad had left us and we had nothing. But what I know is even with our nothing, we had more than the kids in the same situation who lived on the other side of Troost. And so, you know, I got to go to college and graduate school and, you know, I had a, I had a huge advantage in so many ways from my, and now that I know, when I was growing up, I didn't hardly know any black kids. But now that I know people my age, African-American, I listen to their stories, I see those differences even more clearly. So white privilege is what that's sometimes called. We could have called it something else, put a footnote next to it, and, and maybe come up with a better term. Address our biases and recognize racial disparities, disparities as they exist. I think that's important that we recognize there's differences. We must deeply repent. And some people took that and said, wait, you're asking me to repent for something other people have done because I'm not racist and I don't, you know, I, I really work very hard to try to include everybody. And, and I understand that, like me too. Except for I also recognize I still have biases in my own heart and I sometimes don't even recognize them. So deeply repenting. Maybe we should have said something different there. I don't know. I, I kind of like the idea of repenting. What repentance means, and we put it in here, I said, well, define a repentance then. And this is how I define it. It's a change of heart. It's like I recognize there's a problem. I see what I didn't see before. And that leads to a change of behavior. So it's a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of behavior. And I call people to repent regularly here of all kinds of things. Each of us must take responsibility for doing all that we can to dismantle, dismantle systematic racism, systemic racism. That is a phrase that is harder to understand. What would my role look like in that? And how do I go about doing that versus how, you know, so this, I can understand why that was confusing for some people. And I'm not certain all that that looks like, but I think there are some places where, where we can find a role, every one of us, in trying to address systematic or systemic racism. This work will be painful and diff or difficult and even painful. Radical change never comes without sacrifice. Our church has not yet become the fully inclusive reflection of God's kingdom that we yearn to be. And we see that on Sunday mornings. You know, I look up at the choir and there's one African-American left singing in a 150-voice choir, 120-voice choir, you know, or in our services. I mean, we have more people of color coming now than we ever have, and I'm very excited about that. We have, uh, we have some Native Americans, we have Asian Americans, we have uh, Indian Americans, and we have a number of people, uh, African-Americans, and I'm excited by that. When we had the children's choir sing, you know, 15% of the kids were people of color, even though in a three-mile radius around the church, only 5% of the people are people of color. Still only 15%, but it's a start, and I feel pretty good about that. I'm glad that we're making progress. But we want, our church is not yet everything we could be in reflecting God's kingdom that we yearn to be. We must intentionally include people of color at every level of our leadership. Now, intentionally doesn't necessarily mean that we'll always be able to do that. We have committees that are all white. We may not be able to find somebody to serve in that committee. But here's what we did when it, come to, when it came to hiring. We have 400 staff here at Resurrection, paid staff. Most of them are, are, are probably half of them are part-time, half of them are full-time. But what we typically did is we advertised things locally and in our newsletter, and so the people who got the advertisements were all people who looked like us. And we began saying, you know, if we're gonna be a church that reflects you know, the hopes we have of a church that's more multiracial, we probably need to advertise in other places. We probably need to be intentional about trying to find people who are different from ourselves in a variety of ways. And so we've been trying to do that and, and we've had a greater diversity in our staff. Still not probably where we could be, but we're making good progress there. And we cannot allow this to be a momentary call for action, which is usually what happens when something critical takes place. Is we, it's got its 15 minutes of fame, and then we set it aside, and we don't want to do that. Instead, this must be an ongoing movement. We are committed to increasing the number of opportunities for our congregation across all campuses to learn from, listen to, and be led by black people and people of color. Last Saturday morning, we had an event here, and it was really cool. We had a one-star general who came uh, to speak about what happened when Truman uh, decided to integrate the military. And he described how I would have never had a chance to be what I became were it not for the fact that Harry Truman had an aha moment and decided, you know what, we need to change this. Harry Truman's, the way he talked prior to that, talked in pretty racist terms. But something changed for him as he began to know people and as he began to say, something's got to change in the military. All right, so from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required, and from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. The biblical call to justice demands that we work to reverse the scourge of racism. So racism is a sin, and our aim is to try to work for a society that doesn't 
seem dictated by sin. We will dedicate resources to overturning Kansas City's entrenched economic, racial and economic divide. So I had people say, well, like, so are you giving money to Black Lives Matter, our church money to Black Lives Matter? No, we have nothing to do with Black Lives Matter, the organization. Um, I don't even know, I really haven't even kept up with that. I have no idea what they're doing. But what we have done is we've said, how are we gonna work better with uh, St. James United Methodist Church, the largest predominantly African-American church in Kansas City? Where are we going to be? And we've already been doing this with our schools and in low-income communities and everything else, but how are we going to be addressing Kansas City's history of race. So you may remember about 20 years ago, Kansas City was listed as the 13th most racially major American city in the, in the United States. And that dividing line has been truced, and there has been a little progress, but not nearly as much as there could have been over the years. So we feel like that's, and that's been a part of our vision since we started. I mean, really going back to, to 1992, I think was the first time I preached about that that I believe God is calling us to take down walls and to build bridges so that when it comes to race, Kansas City looks more like the kingdom of God that Jesus talked about. Opportunities for people of color and housing, health, education, and employment, and limits. Uh, so we're dealing with the disparity that restricts these things and limits their access to security and justice. We'll work alongside community partners until Kansas City looks like the peaceable vision Jesus referred to as the kingdom of God. If we are to love and serve God with our whole hearts, we need to work to eradicate injustice towards our neighbors. Our goal is longstanding justice and equality for black Americans, indeed, all people. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So in answer to the question, I, I think... There are things in there that, and you know, I would have put a footnote by, I would have said, here's what's meant by this, and maybe I would have softened it. And at the same time, sometimes I need to read something that shakes me up just a little bit. And, uh, and it's not expected, just like the social principles, that everybody's going to agree with everything that we say or uh, any sermon I preach. But instead that we are going to go, okay, but at least we said something. And most of the people I've talked to who have, who have had conversations about this said, you know, I agree with most of what's in there. It's this one phrase or this other phrase. And, and as senior pastor, when we had a team working on this and we tweaked it and worked on it, tweaked it and worked on it, partly I thought, you know what? I don't need to soften so much that it's not recognizable for the document that they put together. And so, and, and I know there are some of you in the room who would disagree with the statement, parts of it, and that's Okay. It's just okay. I know you're not, a, you know, I know you're not, you know, you're, you're not a, a doing this because you're a racist or something else. I know that there are certain things that just hit you the wrong way. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, how we think about a variety of things. So anyway, I'm just saying, um, I don't think we're going to change the statement, but I do still think we should add some footnotes to it. So when I have time, my plan is to do that, which may be when I retire. Um, all right. Let's, let's share a few other things um, that are here. Does God bless second marriages after divorce or consider them to be adultery? So um, Jesus says something really harsh about divorce. He says that you are not supposed to get divorced, and if you divorce and remarry, you've committed adultery and caused your first spouse to commit adultery. We may have talked about this a little last week, but so when you read Jesus, there's two things I want to remind you of. Jesus speaks in prophetic hyperbole. He lives in a time where women had virtually no access to jobs, economic welfare, a whole host of other things. Men were allowed by the priests. The priests allowed and interpreted uh, something that Moses said uh, as allowing for a man to divorce a woman for any cause. If she smiled at him the wrong way, if he didn't like her cooking, they could get divorced. Now she's already been married and now she's divorced and who's going to marry her now? So now she's a second tier potential bride. And so um, knowing this, I believe, helps us understand what Jesus says because he's speaking to men because women couldn't fall for divorce and he's saying, yeah, this is not how God intended it to be. And so if you married her, you're to be in relationship and care for her for the rest of your days. Now, we have to take that and interpret it in the light of what Jesus actually did. So there is a moment when Jesus shows up at a town called Sychar. Uh, today it's called Nablus in the Holy Land. And he shows up at Jacob's well, and he waits there and sends his disciples on into town and says, you guys go in and get something to eat. I'm going to just wait out here. That's weird. Okay. So Jesus waits, and it's about noon, and there's a woman who comes out to draw water. Women drew water in the morning or in the evening, but not at noonday because it was hot at that time of day. The only reason a woman comes out at noon to draw water is she's embarrassed to be around the other women or she's made to feel like she's an outsider or despised by them. So Jesus is waiting there for this divine appointment with this woman. And you may remember, Jesus says, uh, 
you know, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, I know. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And then if you read, Jesus offers her living water and shows her love and grace and calls her to be the first missionary to the Samaritan people. Don't you love that about Jesus? So he offers us this prophetic hyperbole and this really hard thing, and then he shows us that he loves a woman who's been married and divorced five times and is now living with a man and doesn't even make a stink about the fact she's living with a man and sends her out to tell other people who she's met and offers her living water. So I think Jesus, I feel like Jesus raises the bar and then he lowers the threshold. He says, this is the ideal and this is what you were made for. But you know, I've been with people. I remember sitting in my office one day with a woman who had been raped by her husband multiple times kicked by him, abused by him, cursed at, at, you know, he'd cursed her and called her every name you could think of. And she felt like she had to stay with him because what Jesus said in this passage. And I told her, I said, Jesus never intended marriage to be a prison of torture. He intended two people to care for one another selflessly with agape. And I don't know when your marriage stopped being a marriage, but it's not been a marriage for some time. And he doesn't want you to be hurt. You are his daughter. Now, you know, I think we need to try really hard to make marriages work because Alon and I, I was thinking of this, this last night, we've been married 42, almost 42 years and there have been at least three times during that marriage we could have easily said, you know what, this is it. Uh, but we fell out of love, you know, it's just what happens. We had two children and I was going to, or one child and I was going to school full time and we had nothing left for each other. And there were other times where, you know, we could have walked away. But it was because Christ called us to be together and this understanding of marriage where, you know, we got to really work at this. And today I look at her and I think, I am more in love with her than I have ever been in my whole life. And we're going to grow old together and I'm going to be so grateful for that. But it almost didn't happen were it not for the fact that Jesus raises the bar. But then when you've been divorced, he lowers the threshold. And, uh, and I think when you have, so this is me talking, looking at that story I just read to you. But I think there's a place where when it's all said and done, you know, so sin means to stray from God's path. And God's path is that two people live together in love for the rest of their lives. But sometimes that doesn't work. And when that doesn't work, the question is, is there room for somebody to, to be remarried? And in that, I think that's a part of God's gift of grace. To say, I want you to, I want you to, I mean, if God looks at you as his child, I think he says, I don't want you to be alone if you want to be with somebody. And I want you to find what you always were looking for and maybe never had. I have to be really careful how I say that because on, a, on any Sunday, there's 30,000 people listening to worship and some of those need to just try harder or go get counseling or something else or be more graceful towards each other. But there are some of them that God may be saying to them, daughter, son, I never wanted this for you. All right, uh, I'm almost out of time. I got five more minutes. Can you stick with me for five more minutes? I'll get a few more of these questions answered. Okay, so here we go. Um, is there a non-forgivable sin? Why or why not? So Jesus once says, any sin can be forgiven humans except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So then I have people go, like, I'm afraid I, I committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And one seminary professor told me this, if you're afraid you did it, you didn't do it. Because <laughs> the very fact that you're afraid that you did is saying that you have a conscience and the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart. And so, but I think what he's talking about there is they were accusing him of doing things, the Holy Spirit working through him, but they were accusing him of being uh, led and powered by the devil. And that was not okay with Jesus. Now, Jesus speaks in hyperbole sometimes, a lot of the times, and you say, come on, he doesn't really speak in hyperbole. If your hand causes you to sin, what are you supposed to do? Cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, what do you do? Pluck it out, right? Uh, it, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And you all are in deep doo-doo if that's the case, <laughs> because compared to the rest of the world, even the poorest of you is, is rich. All right. So, um, and I, and this is, comes to how do we read scripture? One of you asked this question. Do we have to read it all literally or, or not? Well, there are certain passages that beg to be read literally. Like, I think Jesus really meant love your neighbor and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And most of the Bible, I think, is written that way. But I also think that there are places where we read it and we understand either how Jesus speaks or we understand the historical context. And so... Here, I don't think we take Jesus literally. I think we take him seriously. And I find the people who want to take Jesus literally almost always are not the ones who are worried about their own divorce. They want to point their finger at you and talk badly about you. And so, all right. Why do Methodists use unfermented grape juice 
as its communion element instead of wine? What a great question. So the reason why we do is Dr. Welch was a Methodist. So Dr. Welch was a dentist, and they were Methodists like anybody else were using fermented wine. And he thought, you know, we shouldn't get drunk with wine wherein is excess, is the old King James of one of the letters, one of the verses in Paul. And so he invented the process of uh, keeping grape juice from becoming fermented. And we have been doing that ever since. But I like it though. And the reason why I like it is because inevitably there are of the thousands who come and are going to have communion on any given Sunday, there are some who struggle with alcohol. And you say, well, come on, that's just a little dip, right? And it is just a little dip. But I think if this is something that you struggle with, it may very well be that that taste of it might trip you up. And so we use grape juice here. Even though Methodists are not required to use grape juice, you can use wine or grape juice, and I've used both. But generally speaking, um, we use grape juice here, and not just because Dr. Welch was a Methodist. (laughs) All right, what is the Methodist doctrine of atonement? Uh, So we don't have a doctrine of atonement, And it's interesting, neither does the Bible. The Bible has multiple doctrines of atonement. Atonement comes from a made-up word, at-one-ment, in which we are made at one with God. And if you read the Gospels, Jesus never says, this is the doctrine of atonement. He talks about giving his life as a ransom for us, so that's one theory of atonement. And then he, uh, in Paul's letters, he becomes a, uh, a sacrifice for us in our place, and that's another theory of atonement. And then we look at Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that they laid on their life for their friend, and that's another theory of atonement. And there's about seven or eight theories of atonement winding their way throughout the entire New Testament, and never once do we read, this is the only way you can think about the meaning of Jesus' death on the cross. So for the early church too, it was like, it was, and I liken it to this, it's like looking through a kaleidoscope and every time you twist the kaleidoscope, you see something different. And I think every time we look at the cross, we might hear something different. And I've often said it's poetry, it's not math, right? When we look at it, God is giving us, you know, a picture of redemption and poetry where every time we look at it, we see something different about the love of God and our need for grace and mercy and how God accomplished that in Jesus' death on the cross. Oh, man, I have you for, oh, I just ran out of time. Um, I think I answered this question, but I'm going to, I'm going to, can you give me like two more minutes? Okay, all right. So our core pastors, maybe I answered this last week, our resurrection pastors still allowed to choose whether to do gay marriages. I may have told you none of our pastors do gay marriages right now because the book of discipline doesn't allow it. So if, uh, if the discipline changes, which I believe it will in 2024, 2026, it will remove the language that says the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. It will not say every pastor has to do a gay wedding. It's going to allow people who are more conservative or traditional to hold their views. You've got to love people, but it's going to allow people to be where they are. And if they're more progressive, it's going to allow them to be where they are. And so at our church, we have 28 ordained clergy. And I'm guessing some of them, some of them I know right now are saying, Pastor, I'd, I'd do them right now if you'd let me. I mean, I have gay friends and people in the church and I want to do their wedding. And then others would say, you know, Adam, when it comes to that time, are you going to make me do this? Because I'm not really sure. And I'm like, no, you're not going to be made to do that. Yeah, I want you to do weddings according to your conscience on this, and we can see things differently, and that's what we said as a church, is, is we're going to love everybody, but we might interpret Scripture differently, and there's going to be room for people on both sides, and that's going to be true when it comes to the weddings that we do or don't do. I'm having difficulty understanding why my husband, why my husband? He is 76 years old and has been suffering with Alzheimer's for almost 10 years. He's always been the most kind and lovely husband anyone could ask for. Why him? He worked so hard for his whole life, and this is what happens. I'm really struggling to try to understand And uh, if you're here, I just want to say I'm so sorry how hard that is. That's just such a hard journey. And last Sunday's sermon was really about this, that God doesn't look down and say, I'm going to give this person Alzheimer's. I just don't think that's how God works. I think we know something about how Alzheimer's comes about, and we're learning more and more about that, and eventually we'll have treatments to be able to deal with Alzheimer's. And and if God makes people have Alzheimer's, then we we shouldn't do research. Like, it's God's will, and so we just let it happen. But we don't believe that. We believe that we should be putting money into research because we don't think this is what God wants for people. And so I think the answer to the why question, and so a lot of times you hear, I want to step away from that question for a second. A lot of times you hear Christians say, well, we just can't understand the reasons why. Yeah, we can most of the time. We can understand why hurricanes happen. We can understand why earthquakes happen. We understand what happens in cardiovascular disease. We understand that there are terrible people who do horrible things. And we understand something about how Alzheimer's, how dementia and Alzheimer's, two different things, but how they begin to affect our brains. And we're learning more and more about that all the time. And my hope is by the time, you know, my kids are growing up, we won't have to worry about this anymore. So what I'd say is I'm so sorry. 
but I don't think it was God's will that your loved one has Alzheimer's. And what I know is this, when your loved one can no longer remember anything at all, God still remembers them. And there is some part of that person preserved in their soul that will wake up in heaven fully restored. And that's part of the hope we have. And I can say it's easy for me to say that, and it's different for you to walk that journey. And if it was Levon, I can't imagine how much hurt and pain I'd feel, and I'd be angry with God and all of that, and then eventually I'd think I'd work through that and understand, okay, God, I know you didn't do this, but help me to have the strength to love and care for her well. Okay. Uh, I'll end with this one. Why do we attend church? So can I call myself a Christian if I don't attend church, and why do we attend church? So this is our closing question, but this is what I'd like to say is, first of all, church wasn't my idea. It was Jesus' idea. Jesus had the idea for church. He said, on this rock, in response to Simon Peter's profession of faith, on this rock I will build my ecclesia, my church, my people, my community, and the gates of hell are not strong enough to withstand the onslaught of my people. And there was something important to Jesus about doing life together in community. So Jesus didn't come out and just do all this stuff by himself. He called 12 disciples. Then he called a bunch of women, some of whose names we have, and they follow him around. And then he had 72. And then on the day of Pentecost, it was 120. And so there was something about this idea of community, and we help each other, and we bless each other, and we encourage one another, and we can do more together than we can do apart. Church was not my idea, and it wasn't the Methodist Church's idea. It was Jesus' idea, and it seems to be really, really important. And that's why. So I will tell you, whoever asked that question, good question, I believe you need church. There's something that happens when we sing together where we experience God's presence in a way that that I don't when I'm singing in the shower. There is something that happens when we gather for worship and, and the scriptures are being read or a testimony is being given or the sermon is being shared that helps me find my true north when I'm not preaching. I go to church when I'm not preaching. I'm on vacation, I go to church because I need it. My soul needs it. And I need the community of people as well. And so I think we need that, but I also think Jesus was saying, I want you to be together. The entire New Testament was written to church. It was written to communities of people. Even the the letters written to individuals, like 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus and Philemon, these were all people who were in the church and written about how we live together in community and how we're meant to love each other and how we work out our faith. And so what I'd say is I think church is really important. And today, you know, we have access and the ability to go to church online or on TV and not just coming in person. But I think there's something valuable, if you can, to come in person. And every week I meet some, I have people at Easter who this is their first time back since COVID. And they were like, I forgot what it was like to actually be here in person. It's just different. And so, you know, I think it's really important. And if you can't make it, you can't make it. And so you have church by yourself somewhere, and that's okay too. But I'm just saying there's a piece of what it means to be a Christian that's meant to be lived out in community, and you miss that. And I think it's a huge miss for us. All right, that's all the time I have to answer your questions tonight. And I am so glad you came out this evening. It was really great to have you here. And I want to thank all of you who joined us online as well. Thank you for joining us. This will be posted. If anything I said uh, you found helpful for somebody else who's not here, it'll be on YouTube at the church's YouTube channel and on my Facebook page uh, after tonight. So you can find it actually. It should be posting here in just a moment. But it's great to be with you. Why don't you stand? We're going to have our closing prayer. And then I'd love for you, if you had a chance to connect with somebody, to stick around if you want to and just talk about, okay, what did I get out of that last part of the thing? Where is Hamilton all wet and where do I think he got it right? And and, uh, that's all right. So let's pray together, shall we? God, how grateful we are to you for everything, for our lives, for your love, for this world, for our churches, for your grace. And we offer ourselves to you. We pray that you would help us to be gracious people. When we disagree with other people, to be gracious about that. Help us to love each other well, despite the fact that we don't always see eye to eye. And help us as a church to model for a world that's pretty broken and messed up and divided, that it's possible for us. In fact, our greatest joy is found when we are loving one another as you have loved us. Send us forth with your blessings now. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night.